Welcome back, warriors. Kwe Nin Deluizi Pam Palmeter, and I am the host of this podcast, The Warrior Life. We cover everything from native sovereignty, treaties and land back, to decolonization, reconciliation, and how to support the struggle. So if you're interested in hearing from native peoples from sovereign nations all over Turtle Islands on the front lines of Indigenous resistance, resurgence, and revitalization, then this is the podcast for you. Now, sometimes this podcast is about celebrating the accomplishments of Native people in different varieties of life. And sometimes this podcast is about urgent issues happening right now. And today's podcast is one of those. So stay tuned. Welcome back to the Warrior Life podcast. And today's show is very urgent. So it is critical that you tune into the whole show and share it far and wide. Because as you know, while we might be working on one issue in, a, in one part of the country, in another part of the country, Canada takes advantage of that and continues its attacks, especially on our land defenders. And today we have back with us Canahoose Manual. And all of you know Canahoose Manual. She comes from a very powerful, loving warrior family, the Manual family. You'll remember her father, Art Manual. You'll remember her grandfather, George Manual. They have all been key in native resistance and the protection of our lands and rights and sovereignty. We also know Kanahus Manual has been on this podcast many times before, and it always seems to be when it's at the height of Canadian forces and private transnational corporations really ramping up their attacks on these peaceful land defenders. So Kanahus, uh, welcome to the show. I wish we could have a show where we're talking about something different, but unfortunately, you're still on the front lines receiving all of this uh, attacks and racism. But for people who might not know you, who are just listening and figuring out what's happening right now, could you introduce yourself a little bit? Thank you, Pam. Hello, everybody. My name is Kanahus Beski, Kanahus Freedom Manual. My name means Red Woman and Tanaka. I'm from the Sequatmuk and the Tanaka Nation and in, in so called British Columbia, Canada. As Pam says, I come from a long line of freedom fighters and land defenders, and which um, has really take my whole life. I, I live and breathe this, the movement and our fight for our land, our liberation and our self-determination. Thank you for joining us. I know I can tell you're in a vehicle right now, which usually means that you're on the move. And uh, I think it's important for people to understand Kanahus's background. She has been leading the resistance with her group. It's called Tiny House Warriors. She has been helping to organize Indigenous land defenders and water protectors and advocates behind the scenes. Somehow she finds time to lift the rest of us up to help give strategic advice to really help gather us together in unity and solidarity and not just within our own nation but within all of our different nations whether it's Wet'suwet'en, uh, Mi'kmaq, Haudenosaunee and of course with our brothers and sisters in the United States because they too also come from very powerful tribes and I forgot to mention in the beginning but don't forget Kanahus has been long recognized as a powerful human rights defender. She's been defending Indigenous rights, uh, Indigenous-specific human rights, and she recently won the Carol Geller Human Rights Award in 2021 together and for her work with Tiny House Warriors in trying to defend the land and Indigenous rights. So it's, it's one of those situations where here we have this national, well-known native rights activist, a human rights advocate who has been honored with human rights awards on the one hand. Then on the other hand, the Canadian state and corporations effectively treating her like she's dangerous or some kind of danger to the public or a terrorist or some kind of eco-terrorist that's going to hurt people. And we all know that that's not the case. So um, for people who don't know Ken Hoos, can you just tell us a little bit about the work of Tiny House Warriors and why you won that award? Tiny House Warriors 
is a mission. A tiny house warriors is a mission to stop the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And we decided a group of women with our Suquamook Women Warrior Society to fight the Trans Mountain Pipeline, to resist the Trans Mountain Pipeline by building tiny houses on wheels to deploy and launch in the path of the Trans Mountain Pipeline that that's really executing the, the destruction right now as we speak by building this 1,152 kilometer pipeline. But four winters ago, we went out and and stopped the pipeline construction, the man camp construction, and we've been targeted. Um, really, the targeting comes from the assertion of our Sequatmug rights and title on the ground because we are leaving the Indian reservation. We're bring, bringing these home structures onto our territory, unceded territory that we never signed treaties with the British Crown or Canada or, or British Columbia. And we're literally taking land back, you know, asserting our, our rights and our title to our land, our self-determination. And, and land is the, is the big issue because we've never given up our land. And this is why I believe Canada deems us as such a, a as, as a big threat is over land because Canada has gotten very wealthy over the theft of Indigenous lands and resources and made them very wealthy in the world. And, you know, Tiny House Warriors are mainly a group of women. They're my, my mother, my sisters, my cousins. Um, that we all worked with under the Sequatmug Women Warrior Society. And Tiny House Warriors is, you know, it's amazing. It's it's really empowered so much people um, to build tiny houses on wheels even around in other Indigenous territories because it's been a successful way for us to fight as Indigenous people for our land. One of the things that um, I don't know that enough Canadians understand is that even things like, even if we weren't talking about a pipeline and we were only talking about tiny houses, housing is a human right. Something that's been denied to native people for a long time. Imagine being homeless on our own territories. So Canada itself hasn't implemented the human right to housing. And here you are actually building tiny houses for a multitude of purposes. One, to be occupying mm -hmm. and protecting your lands and, and also actually to be creating houses and places for ceremony mm -hmm. and education and, and all of those things. And so those are the things that I think the public really needs to understand more. And one of the reasons why I first caught my eye on Tiny House Warriors was because you were speaking out directly against man camps. So it wasn't just all of the damage that pipelines we know does to the environment and the invasion of our territories, but it's also the, the threat that comes with man camps. And can you talk about that a little bit? Because I don't know that society understands that with every pipeline, oil field, mining project comes a man camp. Yes, um, the man camps are industrial worker camps that house you know, thousands of workers in our case the pipeline is the pipeline workers there's contractors there's from all over the place the majority of the license plates that are going into these camps are alberta you know ontario they're from other places around the country they're not from this the province of so-called british columbia so they're coming in to these camps there they don't have to be accountable to the community they leave their wives at home and their children at home and that's some of the danger as well so they're leaving their families for sometimes months on end and a lot of the statistics that come out of the camp is there's a lot of alcohol violence there's a lot of drug violence and there's a lot of sexual violence that happens at these camps and that's where the alarms were raised for us as indigenous women because the statistics and the reports are showing that Indigenous women become the, the target of these sexual attacks, like rapes. Mm -hmm. And so we brought a lot of that attention out. There's a, already existing reports out there. It's not like we're, we're finding new data. It's all out there because of these man camps, fracking fields and oil fields and pipelines and even road construction, like all of the type of development that made this country had man camps, the original occupation of Canada, the Hudson Bay Company, man camp, mm -hmm. the railway, man camp, the, the building of the Trans-Canada Highway, man camp. So we've been dealing with that as Indigenous women. We felt the impacts of that. Of that. And, you know, by bringing that attention out, and we've also been targeted by those same type of people. So we've had hate attacks come at the camp. We had uh, natives or the... You know, 
white people from like Alberta coming with Alberta plates coming right to our gate to bring violence and attacks on us. And like I said, we're a majority woman camp. So they're attacking us women when they come to our to our barricades. We call them safety barricades. Government may call it a blockade, but we had to create these safety barricades within our village because we call tiny house warriors a village because there's six tiny houses there. And a lot of the people that come to help and assist be frontline land defenders and human rights defenders leave their comfort of their own homes and their established homes back in their communities to pretty well just give up all of that to to sacrifice their life to be there on the front line because we need frontline land defenders we need people actually on the ground or else all the natives are going to be in the city and on the reserve and no one's going to be on the territory fighting for it so it, the front lines are very important and so it's not only the attacks that we're receiving from from the pi pipeline workers, but like literal civilians that are coming from other provinces that are working in the oil fields in Alberta. So, you know, these attacks are happening online and then they're spewing out actually on the ground. You know, for all of those who are watching or listening right now, refer to the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls, refer to Amnesty International's report on man camps, look at Human Rights Watch, you know, those who take us away. There are a ton of reports that talk about this association between man camps and actually murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls, not just threats, but physical assaults, harassment, abuse, uh, disappearances. And that hope happens all over our territories in what's now known as Canada and the US. Some of the biggest extractive industry projects are responsible for the highest rates of murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. And you can literally measure it wherever those projects are. So I think that's mm -hmm. another reason why people need to understand this isn't just about the pipeline per se, although that's mm -hmm. bad enough. It's all of the violence that comes with it. Now, Kanahus, you and I have done several conversations about what's been happening over the years with uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline. Um, and people often misunderstand that these fights are primarily in the courts, that it's one First Nation, you know, filing judicial reviews or appeals or constitutional challenges. But the real fight appears to be on the ground, because although you all come in as as uh, in ceremony and as a village and as a collective, you know, to protect one another in peace and, and to make sure that you're protecting the plants and animals, the people mm -hmm. that are on the outside, uh, you know, whether it's the man camps, but also from what I've seen in the media, you also have a severe issue with surveillance, don't you? Like, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening right now with surveillance? Because it looks like it's more than just the RCMP doing surveillance. Yeah, we have major surveillance happening at, on us at all time. Physical surveillance. We have this the the cyber surveillance that's happening online as well. But some of the the scary surveillance that happened um, of July 2020. Well, we've had so much different surveillance, but in July 2021 was when they came in to defense off the area around the man camp. Mind you, we've already been established. We have our, our tiny house warrior village there. They came in and start with around 50 men. They came in and start removing some of our safety barricades and we had to stop them. They start threatening us with arrest that if we impeded them or went, stepped in front of them while they were, they were trying to pretty well invade our village um, that we would be arrested and they had an injunction in their hand and they they put up a fencing but they also put up these um, surveillance towers they have retractable arms that lift all the way into the sky that their cameras were facing right at my door entrance and my bedroom and the tiny house so I could I couldn't even leave my house without them knowing I'm leaving my house and where I'm moving because they had all these uh, security, I don't know what to call them. They're big, huge security. Yeah. They haul them in the back of a trailer and they mount them there. They put mount the four legs in the corners. They have uh, a big megaphone that says, move back, you're too close. We're going to call the police. They have like spotlights. They have major st spotlights. The Those are those are so terrible in the night sky way out there in the middle of the mountains. They have them directed right towards our village. So we don't even get night sky anymore that we have. It looks like 
it looks like a prison actually the the amount of flood uh, spot, spotlights they have shining on us around these three layers of fencing so now they have three layers of fences not just one layer three layers of fencing and they have four trans mountain security at our front entrance of our tiny house warrior village because they effectively put their entrance for their man camp their whole entire man camp right in front of our entrance so it's just there's conflict happening every day because of what they've done and then they blocked off our back entrance so we don't even have access to leave out the back now on the road because they put a fence there um, and fenced us off so we only have one entrance and they pretty well control it because every time their trucks are moving back and forth they line for security up facing us and the other day um, we had the the SPCA go there to they said they got a complaint from the man camp what? they said that they, that our dogs were tied up to the man camp fence which was a lie and my mom caught him trying to come into our safety barricade into our village and said no you got to go out and escorted that SPCA out who happened to be a native man and who happened to say he used to work for tribal police and my what? mom told him no you can't come in but even to try to harass us over our dogs and we have purebred huskies we mm-hmm. are dog lovers we we raise puppies we you know we have three sets of batches of puppies there at the tiny house warriors we gave puppies you know full blood hu- husky puppies okay. to the native community we never get those and so we appreciate our dogs as our protection and they're sacred to us as Sakwamuk mm-hmm. people and for them to come and target us and our dogs, that was just in complete violation too. Um, but yeah, we're completely on surveillance. People who are commenting on our Facebook posts are even considered persons of interest. And this came out under some freedom of information that wow. people are getting, journalists and professors are receiving. And just major surveillance. And when even when we do get freedom of information, one of the lawyers that represent Tiny House Warriors got to put a freedom of information request in. Everything was redacted. Some of the pages were completely black, like with everything just crossed out. So we don't even get to see the type of surveillance that they're doing on us because they redact everything and we can't even see it. So but we know for sure that they are they're monitoring our our online social media they know that the power of social media, because sometimes mm-hmm. the mainstream media will publish lies, you know, yeah. and it's our social media is the only thing that we have to be able to like really say the truth of what's happening on the ground. And we've had community industry response group, who was a new division within the RCMP that was formed, positioned right facing us in our village, you know, sometimes up to three community industry response groups parked there wow. surveilling us. And really looking out for the, the, they'll bring ice cream and they'll bring coffee and they'll bring that up to the Trans Mountain security officers because some of those security wow. guards are 20 plus years in the RCMP and then taking a Trans Mountain security job. So a lot of them hold seniority mm-hmm. over the RCMP that are actually coming on the ground, uh, the amount of years that they have over these, them. So, but they, the Trans Mountain security they follow us every time we leave tiny house warriors they follow us they they're they follow they tail us not just follow what? way back like a mile they tail us they tail us all the way to vancouver to kamloops our native youth that come from edmonton they follow them right to the alberta border then an, another security takes over that's responsible for that segment of the line so these are young families with babies that are coming to visit and really connect with tiny house warriors because we're not just more than a resistance to pipeline. Like you said, we mm-hmm. have ceremony, mm-hmm. we teach cultural teachings. We we teach a lot of cultural teachings to the young people that come. A lot of the young people never get to sweat lodge, never get to go and take cold dips in the, in the water. You know, they never get to sing the songs by the fire. You know, they don't don't even get to hold a drum. So like we offer a lot to the young people who are trying to decolonize, want to go back to our ways and yes. really building them up there at Tiny House Warriors, even though we're surrounded by surveillance inside that perimeter of Tiny House Warrior Village is really a freedom camp. It's a liberated autonomous zone. Once you step on that side of the barricade, you're not in Canada anymore. 
you're in an autonomous Sequatmog village there at Tiny House Warriors, and that's what's empowering. It's empowering our young people. You know, there was young people that stood up to become amazing organizers, you know, out of learning everything from the from Tiny House Warriors because, you, you know, even with the young people, they're being targeted. They're going back into Vancouver. They're going back into Edmonton and they're being tar targeted by the city police because of because of whatever um, information, surveillance information that they're sharing. And that's the scary thing. How are they sharing this surveillance monitoring information with other policing agencies or other security or Trans Mountain Corporation itself? We don't know. We don't know where all of this information is going that they're collecting on us. Well, it really goes to show the problem, the effectively collusion between the Canadian state, all of its like government and law enforcement agencies, but also these transnational corporations that operate not just here in Canada, but around the world. Um, uh, the fact that they would share information and that's no secret. So that's not just a claim that we're making. There are a ton of media stories. I can post links to some of them. Access to information requests, which show they actually share information, private information about peaceful land defenders. Now, have you ever seen the RCMP work with a, a native people on the ground and say, you know what? There could be some danger at that man camp. Let's start sharing information about who's in that man camp and what all their criminal background is and all of that. No, they would never do that. So it shows a high degree of bias. But for those who who haven't heard our previous shows, and I encourage you all to listen to Kanahus and I before, there's a reason for that. You know, the, the media found out that the RCMP have their pensions invested in pipelines and that in fact the largest public pension systems are all invested in the extractive industry so this isn't just about jobs this is about the big time money and their pensions and obviously that's why that's happening what gets me kanahus is that you you've worked so hard to set up a place of of freedom where you can celebrate your language and culture and and pass on those traditions and reconnect people Yet you're treated as though you are the world's most wanted. Effectively, by blocking you in and having all of those spotlights and loud horns and who knows what else. I mean, do they have, you know, heat revealing cameras, like all of those things. They are treating you as though you're living in a, in a military prison camp. And, and mm -hmm. the fact that it, it's not enough just to treat you like that. Then they have to send in the SPCA. They have to harass mm -hmm. you on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I've seen footage mm -hmm. of a car ramming um, you like that was some time ago. It's like they don't stop. And, the, you know, the fact that the SPCA would get involved actually was a shock to me. I, I thought that they were a good organization. I didn't realize that they would get themselves involved in such a, a racist and violent endeavor when We've all seen your puppies. We've all seen how you care for them. Even on this show, we've seen lots of puppies and, and how you share them and, and how they have like free range. And if, if, if you ever did tie up a dog, who doesn't tie up a dog? Especially like think of all the people who, who use dogs for different professions, you know, whether it's for protection, whether it's for running sleighs, tying up your dog isn't an offense, even if you had done it. But the, it's the, the lengths to which they will go to harass you. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what's mm -hmm. really concerning. And so mm -hmm. along that line of harassment, um, I understand that even some of the banks are getting involved in this kind of like, like onslaught of surveillance, monitoring and bullying of you. And can you talk about that a little bit? Because I, again, was shocked by what what was happening. Um, yeah, so we've been doing business with a certain credit union for over a decade now. And just the other day, they informed me that they're giving me 30 days to find a different bank for my personal and our organization bank account. And they they gave the the reason of risk standard that we didn't fall within this risk standard. And so they didn't inform me what that was. And we have actual lawyers trying to help us reinstate these accounts again. 
But yeah, we've been targeted, you know, even to the banks and to the credit union. And we've been trying to really inform people to pull their money out of big banks that are doing, you know, business with pipelines and to go to more of these smaller banks like credit unions and stuff. And then meanwhile, this credit union just shut us right down. And really, it's discrimination and someone from the higher up getting involved um, because they really didn't want to speak on it. They just wanted to say, like, the decision was made from Kelowna. Oh, wow. And, you know, I just think for what purpose? So unless you're like the head of some kind of mob or you're, you know, funneling funds or, you know, all of those things, like if you're just being you, which you are, and you're just trying to, you know, have funds for yourself and funds for tiny house warriors, it makes, there's no other reason to imagine that they would target you this way, except for the deeply inherent racism that's in with those banks? Or are they talking to the RCMP? Are they talking to Trans Mountain Pipeline? Are government officials suggesting, look, just cut her off and then she won't be able to do anything? Like, it makes you wonder. I don't know. But I'm, I'm certainly glad that you have lawyers trying to help reinstate it because wasn't that long ago. Remember when that uh, grandfather and his granddaughter went into the bank and, and, you know, tried to get some of uh, their money and they were both handcuffed and arrested and treated terribly by both the bank and the police. Like, so it, mm -hmm. it doesn't surprise me, but to go to the extent of trying to cut off mm -hmm. your funds, I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's absolutely incredible. And then I think about all of it and the violence that goes along with it. Now, in one of our other shows, we talked about um, that when the police arrested you, the RCMP arrested you, they injured your arm. Um, and we've seen the a truck that was rammed into your camp. We've seen I've seen footage and pictures of what looked like Trans Mountain Pipeline folks or security harassing, throwing rocks, even putting hands on you and some of your family. Is that still happening? Yes, the violence is still there. Um, I was, I have a lawsuit against the RCMP right now for my wrist being broken during an arrest and it was a wrongful arrest and I got, I got, those charges got dropped because the cop identified a different person. Um, so it was a wrongful arrest that I got my wrist broken for and targeted by I know that the arresting officer that arrested me when he very first day of the community industry response group briefing, they were briefed about me first day on the job, first day of the whole division being formed, they were briefed about me. They should have briefed them properly that I'm not a threat, yeah. that I'm not going to run, that I'm not going to fight back, that arrest was always peaceful because I'm dealing with human rights and we're fighting mm -hmm. for our human rights, our indigenous rights. And and uh, I've got attacked by workers with shovels, with axes that came at me. Um, and just because I'm the first one that will go to the barricades, I'll go to the barricades, I'll go to our safety barricades to confront people so they don't think they could just march into our village. And those four security guards and well, when they were first building the camp, there was, there was a lot, there was around 100 men. They came from Aries fencing the Aries fencing from Kamloops. They're um, some of the people that that assaulted my sister, um, the Trans Mountain security workers. They ass assaulted my, my twin sister. And this was all there at our front entrance of the tiny house warriors. There's actually five people that have been charged with assault, but they have actually been assaulted by Trans Mountain security. And we're fighting those cases right now as we speak and trying to raise money for these five individuals. They all pled not guilty. Wow. Um, the assault isn't just the only charge they're charged with. They're, they're charged with even assault with a uh, deadly weapon. Um, they're a mischief loitering they're charged oh with. my gosh um just uh, crazy types of charges that they're trying to just rack up all these little minimal type of charges hoping that some of them will stick and and so yeah the women are being targeted but a lot of the times they they'll point at my twin sister and they'll say there's Kanahus. and i have a tw oh. twin sister identical twin sister mayuk manuel and so she has been violently assaulted 
by Trans Mountain Security thinking they were attacking me. So she, she's been wow. targeted because of, because she looks like me. And she's not the only one that's targeted because she looks like me. I have a hat I wear. There was a woman up in Belmont that had a hat similar to mine that was targeted. You know, so like people that even look similar to me that are being targeted when people have tattoos, people automatically think that's kind of who's face oh, tattoos. No, no. So yeah, women just even looking like me, my cousins and my sisters are being violently targeted because of it. And it's, it's bad. It's wrong. It's wrong that they would even want to attack me. Uh, yeah. But it's wrong that they're attacking the wrong person. And then these women are being left with lifelong injuries because of it. It's it's unbelievable. And the fact that it's primarily hidden from Canadians, it's in the media sometimes. Sometimes, you know, there'll be an access to information request or something that's happening. If we didn't have social media, like you said, if we didn't have one another sharing the videos and pictures, we wouldn't know that this is happening. Now, your sister was on a special by Al Jazeera, and there's just like a quick, uh, I think it's about a two minute video that I want people to see so you can understand a little bit more and uh, get to see Kanahus's sister. Camp workers. Mayuk says some of the camp workers involved in the incident are former Royal Canadian Mounted Police. You're not the cops! Get her! She's choking her! They tried to arrest us and say, you're under arrest. Let her go, 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 go. Hey! 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 I'm talking to Diggis for human rights abuse. Just stop. Just stop. And they got their hands on me and knocked me to the ground. Um, I, I see this from video footage but I have no recollection of it, it's, uh, it's black. The police arrested Mayuk and four other land defenders. They were later released and have not faced charges. This is the first time that uh, Mayuk saw some of this footage. And so it's really triggering. Sort of go back and say what happened. Yeah, these came out and thought they could rough up us native women they thought they can have free reign and just throw us around attack us this is a white supremacist country white men could get away with attacking native women and there's no repercussions actually the police are on their side and this whole area that we're intended to protect by being here has been completely clear-cut and now the earth is being moved to house 550 men here yeah but this is our home this is, this is our home. For Kanahus, home consists of roughly 70,000 square miles of unceded First Nations territory. We come from this unceded land where we never signed treaties with no crown, not Great Britain, no colonials. And we can stand here in the silence and be Sukwapmo. We could really be Sukwapmo. Canada's Supreme Court recognized that this land has never been ceded through treaties, but for the Sequamook Nation, it has been a constant struggle to... I mean, j just in that little clip alone, it it's beyond belief, you know? And I think more and more Canadians need to see it, that this is happening on a regular basis, and you're literally trapped in by them on, on all sides. How is your sister doing? The trauma has really affected a lot of us and we've, you know, we've dealt with trauma because of colonization, all of us Native people. So we have our ways to spiritually, you know, our cultural healing practices and stuff. And that's what we have to really result to is just our own traditional healing practices, our cold water dipping, you know, our, our sage and our cedar and our songs and things that are going to continue to keep us strong because it's sometimes it comes to a point where you just want to give up, you know, but our mm -hmm. hearts won't let us, you know, our spirits won't let us, but we have to always rem remind each other, you know, as Indigenous people that like we have to 
take some time, you know, take some time, even if it's four days fasting, take our time to like just be and reflect and pray and meditate because it's heavy. This is heavy work because it's not just one person coming up against you. It's a whole system that's collectively knowingly and willingly participating in the genocide of indigenous peoples here in this country. Anyone working for the crown, any civil servant, they are active participants in genocide here in this country. Well, and, and for anyone who is listening and has not heard about this before, maybe you're from another country, Canahoos is not being dramatic. Canada has been found guilty of both historic and ongoing genocide by the National Inquiry into Murder to Missing Indigenous Women and Girls. But Canada had Canada and the U.S. had long been called out by Indigenous nations, uh, Native Americans and First Nations for its ongoing genocide. And it took this National Inquiry to finally confirm mm -hmm. it. Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, the Prime Minister stood before Canada and said, yes, I accept the findings of the inquiry. And then said anyway and walked away. I mean, that's effectively what he's doing when he hasn't then said, okay, we're perpetrators of genocide. Let's look at what the inquiry said. Let's look at what native land defenders are saying. How can we protect these people instead of, in fact, attacking them? And I feel like they're attacking you in every way possible. So they vilify you in the media. They always try to make land defenders look like rogues or dissidents, or they don't have the support of anybody. They try to criminalize you, get charges racked up, so then they can call you a criminal. Um, they surveil you. They're trying to take your dogs. I mean, that's just, has Canada learned nothing about the, you know, the slaughter of Inuit dogs and the theft of dogs from other First Nations? You know, they're constantly taking our children. They're attacking you physically. They're trying to stop your bank, like to even access your own personal money to feed yourself or, you know, to, to get groceries or to pay a bill. It's, it's phenomenal the way in which they will keep poking around the edges to try to find some kind of weakness. And I don't know that most people understand that kind of warfare that happens against land defenders on a regular basis. We celebrate them in the media, you know, and, and you win human rights awards, but then you have to go mm -hmm. back and this is what you do. So, so can, mm -hmm. can you tell me how important it is about solidarity and some of the work that you're doing now? Because you're not alone in this. There are other Native American tribes and First Nations that are supporting you, you know, in, on the land, but also mm -hmm. behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a lot of people that really love my grandfather, George Manuel, mm -hmm. and my father, Arthur Manuel. And I believe they both were taken too soon from our life. And I accuse Canada for it. You know, just our life expectancy and our health and residential school, why they take our people so soon here in this country and Native people's life expectancy. But what I was, what I learned and what from them and what I learned from all the other land defenders and warriors, you know, Wolverine, Ke Aflo, Ke Asera, Ke Irene, all the grandmothers that were the front line, they, they taught us so much about fighting for our land and never giving up. Like I saw elders there, elders that left the comfort of their home to be on the front line. I stood with them. I was arrested with them. So they can do anything to me and I'm not going to ever give up because the spirit of those grannies and me just witnessing and standing beside them and handcuffed with them will give me the strength to never give up because they never did. They went to their death still being land defenders and fighting for the land. And, you know, it's just the targeting will just strengthen us because we know how to, how to keep ourselves going. And really, I feel the targeting really happened leaving Canada and leaving across the that medicine line, that, that border line, that fake line, um, to travel to other tribes, to travel to other countries, you know, traveling to Europe to to meet with big banks, you know, to tell them to stop funding Trans Mountain the Tar Sands, to really spearhead this 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 fight against the the campaign against the insurance companies. Tar Sands needs insurance, the Trans Mountain Pipeline needs insurance, the pumping stations need, the workers need insurance. 
Well, we campaigned to get these insurance companies to pull out um, of insuring and underwriting Trans Mountain Pipeline. And we were successful in getting 18 companies to pull out. We're still pressuring Liberty Mutual. We're still pressuring Lloyds of London. You know, going, coming across to the border to say, hey, they're constructing this pipeline. We're getting criminalized. Every time we stand up, we're getting criminalized. Where is this transportation infrastructure going? Oh, it's going down into these big tankers that are going to be impacting the coastal fisher communities all the way from, you know, Slaywatooth, where the Westridge Marine Terminal is, where Reuben George and Will George and the family's been resisting. All the way through those inlets, I was able to paddle with Will George through the tanker traffic to through the inlets to see how much traffic there is. There's international planes, there's other cargo, there's there's sea bus, there's so much traffic there. I can't even see how a big tanker could even fit through there when a little native fishing or canoe can't even can't even go through there without any alarms being raised. So like I saw that, you know, just to see the the magnitude of of the cargo traffic that's already out in the inlet. So, you know, it comes down through Lummi, through Rose Point, down to Port Angeles, all the way out to Nia Bay, to the Macaw, to the whale fishing people. We know them. They became famous over the whale fishing. They're fishermen, you know, all the way down to Quinault and like all the Washington state coast and then all the Oregon coast and the California coast, all the way to refineries in Richmond, California. This is a major global energy project. You know, this Trans Mountain Pipeline, it's not just a pipeline, that's just a transportation conduit to get it from the Alberta tar sands, to get it to Richmond oil refineries, to get it to the to the global market. What we're fighting is one of the biggest global energy projects in the world. Native people are standing up and, come and fighting this. And so that's why they're deeming us a threat. But meanwhile, our goal is to protect our land to protect mm -hmm. our rights, our title to the water, you know, the jurisdiction and authority, not over just the, the land that the pipeline is getting built on or the Alberta tar sands mine of an area of the size of Florida that they're mining right now. You know, that's affecting all the indigenous communities in the north. You know, all of us through the pipeline corridor to the tanker traffic is massive. They want to fill 890,000 barrels of diluted bitumen from the Trans Mountain Pipeline into these tanker traffic that will risk all of the salmon. And it's not just the coastal communities that depend on the salmon. Us in the interior depend on the salmon because the salmon go through up every river, every creek, and they spawn where they were. Their DNA tells them that they were born and they go spawn in the back in the same spawning beds. And we house one of the biggest spawning grounds left of the sockeye salmon and the Adams River sockeye run, which is like a half an hour drive from Nesconleth where I grew up. So we've been raised to know that we are defenders of the salmon. We are salmon people. You take salmon from our life, we die. And that's where I am right now. Working with the tribal communities, you know, building this resistance to this tanker traffic, but not just letting all the fight that we did against the pipeline and the insurance companies and the banks, you know, go, no, we're overlapping it onto this fight right now with the tankers. That's major tankers here, Afromax tankers, super tankers that this coast has never seen. And so tribal governments down here in the States are very powerful. A lot of them have casino revenue. So they actually even more powerful being able to um, fight, being able to put legal challenges forward, to be able to build a very sophisticated campaign. And Lummi Nation showed that, you know, with fighting against the coal port and they showed how they did it. They put money into developing a sovereignty department in their tribe where that sovereignty wow. department went full force on combating and fighting this the coal port and they won and they had the money to do it they had the support of the tribal government to do it and so that's you know the the goal is to work with the tribal governments down here in the states to wake them up really and to help to help build this movement this beautiful uh resurgence and alliance amongst indigenous communities, both on the so-called Canada and the US side, because we know we're all related. Um, here, they will consider us the, the, the Coast Salish and then the Interior Salish is what Sequatmuk people are considered as the inter Interior Salish. So we're relatives, you know, and, and it's been beautiful. We hosted a big um, seafood feast at Daybreak Star, one of the cultural centers in Seattle. 
We, I personally drove this truck to, to Nia Bay and picked up 400 pounds of halibut from the macaw fishermen. Wow. Um, you just buy a little piece of halibut for like this big and it's $50. So they really contributed for this feast. A lot of people wow. don't want to see these type of tankers coming down. So this infrastructure, this transportation infrastructure is very big. It doesn't just stop in Canada. It doesn't just stop with the pipeline. It, it's They want to destroy more and they want to bring it all the way down to California. So I've been on the move building and I believe that's like the biggest threat is that they know we need money to move. We need money for planning. We're in this planning stage right now, but there will be an execution stage where we will stand up and fight back and uprise in the masses of people because we know we can. We saw Shut Down Canada, we saw Idle No More, Defenders of the Land. We can see that Indigenous people can collectively build. We saw Standing Rock. You know, we, we know that the people are there as water protectors, as land defenders. Um, here, our pop native population, we all supported Standing Rock. So, you know, coming here and embarking here south of the Medicine Line to build um, relationships and build networks so we can be become more powerful in our organizing is what I really feel that the reason why they cut my bank accounts down is the the fear that they have of Indigenous people uniting together and they see that we're moving around they see I'm moving around it's not just there but also with the the African movement with the Black Panther Party Cubs and and the movement for their self determination and their human rights violations that they're and uniting our forces and our resources and that's what they don't want to see because they know there's power in, in in uniting and solidarity amongst all of us. Yeah, power has always been in our collective, whether it's within our families, especially your family, uh, local communities in the nation or all of our nations coming together. And, and so I'm so glad to see that, you know, I feel like Standing Rock really kind of raised the alarm, uh, especially for the Native American tribes in the U.S., uh, and ever since then, you know, you see them fighting Line 3 and Keystone and Energy East. And, and, and I think people should understand all of this activity is not for naught. There have been so many successes along the way. And I think people need to that's, celebrate that's... and honor those warriors. Like when you stop a pipeline, that's fantastic. When you delay it, that's fantastic. When you cause a review, when you win just one set of litigation, like when you get all of the insurance agencies to stop one by one, you see universities divesting of fossil fuels. You see banks making announcements, no more investments in fossil fuels. Like that is such phenomenal and monumental success, not just for the individual cause, but think about people around the world who are trying to save the climate. And I, and Candace, that's a huge accomplishment. Do you ever take time to actually say, hey, we're kicking ass here? I guess like <laughs> when I see my mom, my mom is the one that inspires me. Cause it's like, let me go and let me let's switch off. I'm going to switch off with you. And she's like, no, I love fighting for my land. <laughs> I love fighting for our rights. And I'm so she's like, don't take that from me. You Aww. know, she's the elder. And so that's how I feel like she's the one that inspires me. My sisters inspire me. My brothers inspire me. And when they don't mm -hmm. get up, when they get up every morning and they just want to fight, they want to <laughs> fight for our, our land and our rights. That That's really inspiring. And our young people and the young people that are coming up that are getting into video and media and arts and yes. you know even tattooing yes. and like all the young people that are just you know embracing our culture and our warrior spirit and they empower me to keep going because then we know we have hope for our future yeah the, the worst thing that could ever happen when sometimes people in the media will ask me oh pam with all this happening don't you get down i mean how do you have hope for the future and i'm like that is the hope for the future what would get me mm -hmm. down what would make me feel hopeless is if no mm -hmm. one spoke up there was no mm -hmm. one on the front lines mm -hmm. that we weren't in this social conflict because people avoid social conflict but that's actually it's a righteous battle like that's how you save the planet that's how we save our lands and our cultures and for again for people who might not know 
the United Nations is also on our side. And think about the United Nations for a minute. You know, it's it's the majority of the nation states around the world. Some of them have been empire states, colonizer states, have done horrendous things to Indigenous peoples. Mm -hmm. But the majority, like the vast majority of those colonizer states at the United Nations and their human rights treaty bodies, they're on our side. I mean, the United Nations Committee for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination has issued numerous letters to Canada calling on Canada to get Trans Mountain Pipeline out of Chequemic territory, to get Coastal Gas Link out of Wet'suwet'en territory, to remove the RCMP, to remove the weapons, to make sure that none of the land defenders are hurt and that nothing goes ahead without the free prior and informed consent of the nation that is involved. And I think, look, even the world realizes this is wrong. Canada is completely offside on this. I mean, and, and that's because of your work. Like when you think about it, we wouldn't have letters from the United Nations committees of any kind were it not for the strenuous international advocacy and support by Indigenous peoples and other nation states around the world. And, and I, I have to notice that it like your your father was very much into the international advocacy and, and how much has he influenced you and and shown that the international stuff is just as or maybe even more important than the domestic. Yeah, my my father, he had always say that we needed to have we needed to be on the ground. We needed to be on the ground because when he went international, when we went national, international, we had to have somebody on the ground so we knew what we were speaking of. We were speaking about what was actually happening on the ground. And my father, he, yes, he did go to the United Nations. He, 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 he submitted like so much submissions to the CER, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. He kept us going even after his death. It was, you know, his, his work that, that he did and he continued to do that we could we didn't stop we continued to do the work even though it took more than a team of us to <laughs> to to do the work of like one man but we continued to do that we we had the help of amazing people you know con continuing to unite and collaborate and submit joint submissions with the Wet'suwet'en mm -hmm. um so it was like us and the Wet'suwet'en and the, the people that are also fighting site three and we're going to continue to go forth with joint submissions and continue to pressure Canada at an international level. And we're we're going to be planning some international tours along with the Wet'suwet'en this coming okay. year, um, not just to the the UN and to human rights um, organizing that's happening in in Geneva, but also to Zurich and to Paris and to London and some of the big banks and insurance companies that companies that continue to to underwrite both coastal gas link and trans mountain pipeline and i think that's really important the the international work is crucial because mm -hmm. canada wants to continue to get away with this genocide but mm -hmm. once we go international we shame canada we expose canada for the human rights violations we have big human rights bodies like CERD acknowledging that there's human rights violations happening in canada to indigenous land defenders is important um, we need to get more media attention overseas and in Europe. We need to have some so look at our legal options mm -hmm. and lawsuits that can be pursued over in Europe. People that have interest in mm -hmm. land where there is no indigenous land where they don't have mm -hmm. consent. And so we got to look at our our legal options. The lawsuits are important. I mean, billionaires they they win their lawsuits. They get they get money too. Yeah. And you know, like we've been. We've never been compensated for any of the transportation corridors that Canada has commandeered on our lands, on our own trade and transportation routes. Those pipelines aren't going through some new ground. Those are mm -hmm. our, our routes. Those are our transportation roads and corridors that we use for our own trade. And yeah. they just commandeered. They took it over. They've never compensated us once for taking over our trade routes. Um, those types of things we showed that we could shut down Canada like the pot their pocketbook Canada's pocketbook their money their wealth how much mm -hmm. money did we cost them what is the financial risk to doing business that don't have consent because we can shut them down what are we we're working right now with a group of researchers and economists to actually quantify actually give that financial dollar amount of the risk yeah. that we pose 
and that they want to they they don't want to put a dollar amount well we'll show them that dollar amount and we'll mm -hmm. start showing the banks and insurance companies that it's risky to do business in canada there's a lot of risk and uncertainty to do business in canada unless you're doing business with native people you know, following our principles and our land use principles, how we want to use the land for any type of business or development. We respect the land. We have a relationship mm -hmm. with the land. We're not going to destroy it. We're not going to build pipelines. We may build, we may grow hemp. We may grow cannabis. Mm -hmm. We may go into the service where we're just going to be looking after our people. Like, we yep. don't know how we got to rebuild our economy. We got to do some mm -hmm. paradigm shifting of our way that we look at our economy, because that's really what's destroying the planet at this point is the money and the that's being mm -hmm. made that people are greedy for that's creating these projects that are destroying the land like pipelines and mining and, and all of this. So we really have to look at our go back and reflect on our indigenous economies and how we are able to have like a very beautiful reciprocal relationship with our with our land and our trees and our flowers and mm -hmm. everything that makes up our economy because you know canada has gotten very wealthy they're not pulling land out of thin air to yeah. to to make money off of it's indigenous lands that they're making money off and like wolverine said where'd you bring that land over was it underneath your fingernails from scratching mm -hmm. your, your, <laughs> your <laughs> That's the only dirt you brought over here to talk yep. about was under your fingernails. And that's what he he would always say to any type of high political person to like, you know, TNRD, you know, any type of ministry. He would tell them where that dirt come from for you to talk about. And that's where we're at right now. We're going to mm -hmm. still fight for our land. And and we do it in the nicest way we can. But my dad said this fight's not going to be nice. You know, they're using yeah. the most dirty politics and tactics against us. Imagine mm -hmm. if we criminalized Justin Trudeau. We wow. went and took we went and blocked his bank account. We went and broke his wrist. We went and arrested him, captured him, shackled him, brought him into jail, made him stay there for three days, four days, five days, seven days, thirty days. Yeah. You know, like happen if we did our, our own arrests on the people that are the real criminals in this country. You know, that would that would really show like the, what the extent they are going at to us. Yes. You know, like if we first it and start doing that to yeah. a real criminal and it's wrong. It's just wrong what Canada is doing. Canada has never had the consent to even occupy our territories. We've never given Canada the ex the, the consent. No. Well, this occupation that's happening on our territories is is illegal because it's all being based off of the old outdated racist doctrines of discovery that said we weren't human and they could come and take our land for the church Imagine. and the crown and the the so and the white people you know so we're still fighting we're still mm -hmm. gonna fight we're grateful to have exposure because it's when we have exposure and we're yeah. able to get on things like this, like your podcast, they, they can't isolate us and treat nope. us the way that they, they want to treat us because they know people are watching. So we need people to continue to watch what is yeah. happening. Go follow Tiny House Warriors. Go to follow all of the social media pages. We'll make sure that we're going on all this December so you can see us, so you can yeah. keep, keep updated comment on our things, so you can make sure the algorithm keeps us in your feeds. Yeah. And we're raising money because we're trying to keep ourselves out of jail. So we have a big legal fund, but we're, we're, we're had to change our banking that's attached to our GoFundMe. So we're accepting EMTs and PayPal to tiny house warriors fund at gmail.com while we establish our new banking situation mm -hmm. um, after being this attack. Um, but we're still doing the work and we're still speaking the language at camp and we're still taking our cold water dips and we're still respecting and looking after our dogs because yeah. they're our protection and we're being the sakwatmuk that we really need to be right now in this day and age, not just for us, but we need to show the world this is who we are. We're sakwatmuk, we're yeah. here and we're here to unite with other Indigenous peoples other people of color that are doing the exact same work as us fighting for their self-determination and their liberation their freedom mm -hmm. and that 
one day we'll all be free together and all of our human rights will be respected and protected. That's the goal. So that one day you and I can have a conversation and it's about the next feast or yes. another, you know, round of puppies that have been born, like just <laughs> yes. all the good instead of just always the struggle. I'm so thankful yes. though, that our struggle is out of love, out of dedication, out of protection, uh, in ceremony, in culture. I mean, where else around the world can you see people in peaceful, but assertive, effective and powerful resistance? You don't see us hang, you know, carrying AK-47s to get our message across. We're, we're doing it and we're winning on the strength of our culture. But we have to remember the toll it takes on land defenders and the expenses, like personal expenses, time, effort, energy, the financial expenses, personal liberties and freedoms, injuries, threats, all of those things. It's important that we remember land defenders like Kanahus doing this. And, I, and I'd also say Kanahus and her, her family and, and everyone that's involved in this, whether it's Wet'suwet'en or Mi'kmaq people, when we're resisting, um, it's, we fight this righteous battle on every front. Some people lose time debating, oh, should we do it on the ground? Should we do it in the boardroom? Should we do it in litigation? We need to fight everywhere, all the time, nonstop. So like you said, internationally, domestically, courts, on the ground, like strategically, all of these ways that we resist is actually getting the job done and it'll be the whole world that benefits from that. And that's the thing I think Canadians and Americans need to understand. We're not trying to hurt anybody. In fact, we're trying to protect you, make sure that we have clean drinking water, make sure that we can all enjoy this territory. And so anyone who's listening, I will make sure to post links and emails to where you can send funds, uh, you know, obviously for the litigation fund, but also for the camp because winter's coming up. And I know, you know, other groups, when winter comes up, they need the basics, you know, they need, you know, firewood and food and, and clothing and all of those other things. So it's important to also send funds for things like camp supplies and, and travel, all of those things. I know trying to fund my travel to the United Nations, that takes a lot of you know, a lot of time, energy, but also finances. So whatever you can do financially to support uh, Tiny House Warriors would be most thankful. But it's it's pushing, it's the publicity. Keep it, you know, keep it in the forefront. We have all of those videos of the attacks. This is what Canada's about. Don't let Canada hide behind any of the political rhetoric. Um, Ken Hoos, I know I always say this, but I really don't know how to thank you and your family. I have been following you. I have been trying to support you the best I can. And, and I would like to think that we can, through this podcast, maybe inspire other people to start doing the same thing. You don't have to be boots on the ground, you know, but you can support in other ways. Um, everyone has their own skills and talents and financial uh abilities. And so you can do that. You don't have to be boots on the ground, but we also need boots on the ground. We also need people who have been a part of this. Um, we also need people, you know, lawyers to be helping to draft these things and researchers and everything else. So whatever your skill is, make sure you do that. But there's one proviso I would always say, don't just randomly go to a territory without talking to the land defenders first, because there's cultural protocols, there's security protocols for you and the land defenders. Um, there's a whole process around that. So make sure you follow all of those protocols. Um, but we need everybody in this. Ken, who's, is, is there anything else that we can do to support you and Tiny House Warriors and basically everybody that's out there trying to um, stop Trans Mountain Pipeline and the tankers and, and the fossil fuel industry? Yeah, I, well, first of all, I want to just say, Cooks Jam, and thank you to you for having us, having Tiny House Warriors here and represented. Um, also, I want to thank all the frontline warriors, the ones that sacrifice all the time. I know I'm one of those frontline warriors and my, my work has taken me over here for a little bit, but the frontline is very important. It's a lot of sacrifice to be there, especially through the winter, especially during the snow removal, because we have mm. to be removing tons of snow. I mean, winter's already on full force up there in Blue River. And so I just 
my mother, Beverly Manuel, and Smitetkwa Manuel, and Mayuk Manuel, my family has been just instrumental in keeping Tiny House Warriors strong and powerful. And the young men, the young men that we need, um, because those warriors are the ones that have the muscle, they're the ones that have the strength to protect the women. So we also need our men and then the warriors on the ground are very important. They're the strength. They're the ones that, the, the reason why Canada doesn't move in so quick is because we have men there. And we have men that are powerful, strong, and um, take leadership from the women. And mm -hmm. that's very important. So yeah, I just wanna make sure that people know that those people that are on front line, and I'm, I'm a frontliner, and I know it's a lot of sacrifice. And you, I raise my children on the front line. They have no other choice because they're with me all the time and so they've had to see violence too you know and we've had to work you know just to work with our youth and our children so they have a different understanding about the work that we do but yeah um please contribute to the legal fund we need that and and it's really keeping a lot of our tiny house warriors out of jail because they're trying to give us jail time now and we don't want to we don't want to spend our, any time in jail at all we don't deserve that and we need to be out on the land and being not in their jails so please help us and continue to stay updated and stay mm -hmm. on our social media feeds um if there's people that have uh, skilled expertise that they want to help with research or legal you can always email me i respond to every single email uh, myself my email is kanahusmanual at gmail.com it's really easy and so if there's any way that you want to help or if you want to work on a fundraiser event in your city with us right. or if you need any if you want to um, I'm also go out and speak at different universities and we just need to be out there as much as we can Toronto is probably going to be my next stop in in so-called Canada I want to get out there to meet with the people and organize and tattoo too because I have to tattoo <laughs> everywhere I go everyone expects it <laughs> and so but it's the medicine that I bring with the tattoo. And so hopefully see everybody in Toronto within this next yeah. couple of months. Yes. Well, that's good news for me. And, and thank you to all the listeners, people who are watching or reading the captions for your support. I will take a leadership role. And as soon as I am done with this recording, I'm going to go send transfers because even just trying to get your bank account back is going to have lawyer costs. It's like, it's just incredible. The amount of cost and camp supplies. So thank you for everything you do. Thank you to all of the listeners. I'll post all of the links that you need and share this far and wide. Uh, till next time, keep living a warrior life. Walaliag.